All right. Thank you so much, D. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you guys in here. Uh, man, it's such a good morning. We are so glad that you guys are here. Uh, we genuinely believe it's not an accident that you're here, that uh, each and every Sunday that we gather, uh, we're gathering in the presence of God, uh, and God wants to encounter you today. God wants to bless you today. God wants to meet with you and stir you. He wants to speak to your heart uh, and change you from the inside out. Like today, God has something for you. And I just want to encourage you to believe for that, uh, to seek God, uh, and to listen carefully as, as we preach through the Word of God. So the Bible, <clears throat> the Word of God, uh, this is uh, God's word to humanity, uh, and it has divine power to bless us when we hear it. Uh, Jesus says that uh, those who hear him uh, and, and do what he says will be blessed, and we know what he says because he's given us uh, his word. And so this morning as, uh, as I preach, as I read from the Bible, I just encourage you to listen, to hear, uh, and to really uh, believe, um, and, uh, and I just believe God will begin to bless you. Uh, he actually, another part of that is the Bible describes Jesus as light, and, and sometimes having light shine, shined upon us is, is not the most comfortable of things, you know. Uh, sin might get revealed, something, a secret in our hearts we might uh, have might get revealed, but the reality is, is Jesus isn't just light that shines in the darkness, he's light that overcomes our darkness. And so uh, there is redemption available, there is forgiveness available, there is mercy available, uh, and, and then there's new life available to you in Jesus Christ today. So I just want to encourage you that way. Uh, and again, the last two weeks we've had baptisms. I want to uh, invite you uh, to consider being baptized. If you've, if you've never been baptized, if you're a believing Christian, you've never been baptized, uh, then uh, you believe Jesus died for your sins, that he rose from the grave, that he's your Lord and Savior. If you believe that and you haven't been baptized, uh, find your communication card on one of the seats and mark uh, baptism. Uh, this is a, uh, baptism is not where the power happens. Power, uh, baptism is the outward declaration of the power that's happened inside, uh, which happens when we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that he died for, for us on the cross, that he rose from the grave. Uh, and so if you're here, uh, you've been a Christian, you've never been baptized, I would encourage you to sign up for baptism. Uh, and if you're here today and you're not sure where you're at with Jesus, uh, I want to invite you to consider uh, the reality uh, of who Jesus says he is, that he says you need a Savior, we all need a Savior, and today that's going to be, uh, we're going to talk about that some, we talk about that every, every week. Uh, but I just want to encourage you, if you don't know where you're at with Jesus, you don't know where you're at with God, uh, to listen carefully uh, what I say today about Jesus and to ask God to reveal himself to you. If you're here and you're like, Lord, I don't know where you're at, but if you're real, show yourself to me. I believe God honors that prayer. Uh, and so this morning, I just invite you in. Uh, the kind of power God can have in our lives uh, is amazing. And in fact, we're going to be talking about that today. The title of my sermon uh, is Real Power and Real Transformation. Uh, so we believe this for every Sunday, uh, that, that, and actually not just every Sunday, every day of our lives. And if you've been a Christian for a really long time, I've got good news for you. I believe Jesus wants to transform you uh, every day of your life in Christ, even after you're in him, right? Once you're in him, he's not done with you. He wants to continually change you and transform you. And, um, and before we jump into our, our main passage today, which is going to be a big one, we're going to be looking at uh, about 20 verse, verses in Galatians. Uh, we're going to be looking at Galatians 1, 11, uh, through chapter 2, verses 10. Uh, but before I get to that, um, I, am, uh, I just have some questions for you. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you this question. Has God ever done anything miraculous in your life? Are you aware of God ever having done something miraculous in your life? Now, there's outward miracles like physical healing. You know, I think those might be a little more rare. I think that also might be what we think of typically when we think of miracle, like an outward miracle, like a healing or, um, you know, our body, something like that, uh, or, you know, us praying for somebody and them getting healed. That's, it still, it still counts. Uh, but I think that tends to be the category we think of when it comes to miracle. Let me ask you this. Have you ever encountered like a spiritual miracle in Christ where he literally changed your heart? If you're here today and you're a believer in Christ, this has happened to you. He has changed you from the inside out. He's transformed you from who you are. So has God ever done anything miraculous in your life? How aware of that are you? Uh, and then let me ask you this. What would it mean to you 
for God to miraculously work in your life. If you're in here today and you're struggling, maybe you're here and you're like, I struggle with depression. You're here, I was like, I struggle uh, with feeling loved. I struggle with feeling forgiven. You know, and, and, and I, str- I struggle, you know, with any number of things. And, and what if God were to miraculously change that? He was to miraculously change your heart and change your life uh, in a way that you don't understand but is real and has power. What would it mean to you if God miraculously worked in your life? How would you respond? Would you respond? There's a story in the Bible where 10 lepers come to Jesus and he heals all 10 lepers. And only one of them comes back to talk to him about it. Only one of them acknowledges it. Right? Would you be like that? Or if God miraculously worked in your life, would it change you? Would you respond to it? I want you to think about this. What would it mean for God to work miraculously in your life? What about people around you? Right? Maybe, you're, maybe you're a Christian and, and there's people around you you wish knew Jesus. And, and you're thinking, man, like, Lord, I wish you would change this person. What would it mean if God changed that person right before your eyes? Finally, last question I want to ask here is, if God asked anything of you, would you do it? Like where you're sitting today, where you're at right now, if God asked anything, like is there anything in your life that God can't have? All right, where are you at with this? Is there anything in your life that God cannot have? Is there anything in your life you don't want him to touch? <laughs> you're like, Lord, stay away from this. This is mine. Uh, I just, I think this is helpful to think about. As we look at our passage today, we we'll are be reading again, starting in Galatians chapter 1. This is our fourth week in the book of Galatians. We're going to be looking at verses 11, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 11, to chapter 2, verse 10. So we're going to read from two chapters today. It's going to come up on the screen behind me. Feel free to follow along in your Bible. <clears throat> I may explain a couple of things as we read it, but then we'll pray at the end, and, uh, and then we'll jump in. Uh, This is a letter to a church, and this is what it says. This is a guy named Paul writing to a church, and he says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Paul's saying the message that he preached, it's not from men. It's not from men. He says, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age uh, among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers, but when he who set me apart from before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Paul's saying he got this divine gospel, the divine truth about Jesus being Lord and Savior, dying for his sins, raising from the dead. He got this straight from Jesus. And when he first heard, he didn't go check with the Christians. Uh, In fact, it says that when he tried to go to Christians early in his faith, they were scared of him because he had been persecuting them. He had been trying to kill Christians. He says, I did not consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So apostles were like the early church leaders in the Bible, and Paul's saying, I didn't consult with Christians, I didn't go to them, I didn't check this message with anybody, I received it straight from Jesus, I received received it straight from God. Then he says, then after three years, he had been preaching to Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people. Right? So Gentiles are anyone that's not a Jew, which is basically the, most of the world. Uh, and then Jew, Jew, Jewish people are people uh, of Israel, the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, it says, he says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem, which is where the church was based at the time, to visit Cephas, one of Jesus' disciples, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. The, they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Don't miss that. He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me, because of Paul. 
Jump to the next chapter. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, ta- taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set, be- or the- and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I had proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. Right? So again, he received this gospel from Jesus himself. He went off and he preached this gospel. And then 14 years later, he comes and he's like, oh, hey, by the way, this is what I was preaching. Uh, and he brings it to the church leaders, right? The other Christians. Uh, and it- here's what it says. Because uh, he didn't want to, he's like, well, I want to make sure I hadn't been running in vain. I haven't been preaching a false gospel, basically. He's been doing it for 14 years. Uh, But then it says, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So again, that Gentile, uh, he's going to talk about circumcision here in a minute. I'm going to explain this. Uh, So this distinction between Gentiles and, and Jews, what does that mean? Well, again, Jewish people are God's people of the Old Testament. Everyone else is Gentiles, and God gave them a sign that they were his people that was circumcision. And if you're not sure what circumcision is, I, I Google it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so he gave them the sign of circumcision, uh, and so everyone that's non-Jewish, not, not, they were not the people of God, right? They were not circumcised. Uh, and so one of the early debates in the Christian church was, is Jesus enough to make us God's people without being circumcised? Does that make sense? That was one of the early church debates. Is Jesus enough to make us God's people without receiving the sign of circumcision? Uh, and, and the Bible clearly says, yes, Jesus is enough, that we come to faith in Christ purely by God, receiving God's grace and mercy, not by any kind of work. Uh, and, and circumcision is, uh, it's a work, it's a sign, it's something we would take on uh, that, that validates, that, that makes us God's people. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 I am the one who does this. So Paul's saying not even Titus, who was a Gentile, who became a Christian, when he brought him to the disciples of Jesus, and he talked about the gospel, they, were, they did not say he needed to be circumcised. They're saying, no, no, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And then uh, he says, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. Right? This is important. He's saying, he's saying in Christ there's freedom, there's grace, there's mercy. It's not our works. It's God's mercy and grace that, that, that gives us life. It's God's mercy and grace that makes us God's people. And he's saying they're trying to bring us back into slavery. That is to say it is our effort that makes us God's people. It is things like circumcision that make us God's people and not just God's grace. Jesus is enough, Paul is saying. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment. I love Paul. It's like, we did not yield. Jesus is enough, is what Paul is saying. We did not yield even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. What's the truth of the gospel? Jesus is enough. Jesus does the work. And from those who seem to be influential, Paul says, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Paul is saying Jesus is enough, and they're saying you're right. They didn't add to him. They didn't say, oh, change this or change that. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, right? So uncircumcised, Gentile, circumcised the Jewish people. So Paul is going to the rest of the world. Peter is preaching to his Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, <clears throat> says, for God uh, worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, that is the Jewish people, and that same God worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, who by the way is Peter, Jesus' is apostle Peter, he just said, you know, Peter called Cephas. Uh, when James and Cephas and John, right, these were three of Jesus' closest disciples, who seemed to be pillars, when they perceived the grace that was given to Paul, they gave him the right hand of fellowship, uh, to, and not just to him, but to Barnabas as well, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. A lot of scripture there, uh, but man, the word of God, it's life to us. We're going to see it today as we dive in here. Would you guys pray with me this morning? 
Heavenly Father, I do ask that you would just come uh, and be here among us today more heavily. Father, I pray for your presence in hearts this morning. I pray you pour your Holy Spirit that, that people who are here would sense your presence as the word is preached, sense your presence as we sing songs that proclaim your biblical truths, Lord. I pray that you would draw near to us more and more, that if there's anyone in here who they're walking a half-hearted life with you, that you would electrify their spiritual lives this morning, that you would win them over to a deep all-in pursuit of you, Jesus, and the life that you have for them. Father, I pray this morning that you would take all of us deeper into your great love, that we would experience all that you have for us. Father, we are asking for you to move today, for you to stir hearts today. Father, if you don't move, if you don't do something this morning, then there's no point in us gathering here. So Father, I pray you come and you move right radically, that this morning you would stir hearts, that you would shine your light upon our hearts, that, Lord, the chains would be broken. Lord, people who have hidden sin in their lives, while it's painful for it to be revealed, it's glorious because you redeem, you forgive, and you make a way for us to be set free from the things that bind us, set free from the addictions that grip us. Lord, I pray this morning you break chains. I pray this morning you stir hearts to be convicted and repentant. Lord, I pray today that you would bring freedom and life, joy and peace. I pray this morning that eyes would be open, that Christianity isn't some addition to life. It's not some insurance policy for people who go to church, but rather it is a full surrender to a joyous, purposeful life, walking with you, Jesus, each and every day to see your eternal purposes accomplished in this world. Lord, we all have temporal things we do in this earth. We take care of things. We work simple jobs. We make little changes. But God, you have an eternal plan that as we walk in you, you want to accomplish through us. Lord, my mind does not comprehend this, but it is your great pleasure to do so. You even said in this passage, you were pleased to reveal Jesus to Paul. You were pleased to reveal a call to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Lord, you are pleased this morning to reveal your son to us, and you are pleased this morning to call us into a life richer than any we could know on our own. Father, I pray, move in hearts today, stir us up today, have your way, Lord, that we would be a people of blazing hearts for your glory and a people of full surrender for your purposes. God, that we would see your kingdom come and your will be done here on this earth. In your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. amen. All right, <clears throat> a little light pre-sermon prayer, right? Uh, <laughs> so, the big idea, you're like, that's a lot of scripture. What's the big idea here? What, what, what is it we're supposed to get out of this? And, and what I'd say to you is this, is that, I, well, one, we're going through the book of Galatians. I highly encourage you to read through the book of Galatians as we talk through it, as we teach through it. Um, and, uh, and I just believe God will bless you. I spend a lot of time in the word of God, um, not for the sake of prepping sermons, but I do spend time in it for prepping sermons. But I spend a lot of time in the word of God, primarily for the purpose of, of knowing God, seeing God, being with God, and it is the greatest joy in my life to be with God. And I don't say that facetiously. That's not just, oh, he's a pastor. He has to say this. I believe this is true for all of us, that the life that God has for you is the richest part of your life, the greatest treasure of your life. Uh, and as you spend time in the word, you begin to see God's like reality here. And there's some reality here I want to point out, reality and truth, right? Like the Bible brings us truth. Uh, Jesus is light that shines and reveals what is the real world, what is truly true about our world. When you spend time away from Jesus, you will be confused, you will be tricked into believing darkness is good, right? That's what happens. When you spend time around Jesus, he is light, he illuminates, he shines, he reveals things. And sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's shocking. And in fact, that is why oftentimes people don't come to Jesus because they realize what he says and who I am are opposed to one another. But the Bible says he is light, you're in the dark. Right? You know how many people are like, no, I'm in the light. The Lord is in the dark. Right? He doesn't know. How dare he? Uh, there's a lot of people like that. And if you're, if you, like, here's the thing, that, that impulse is in every single human, uh, like, na in our natural, um, like, our natural flesh, the Bible would say. Like, our, like, like there's, a, there's a sinful part of our, our fallen bodies that even in Christ still kind of is an act of rebellion to God. Um, and, uh, and, it, and, and that part of us can still try to call God's light darkness. Um, but anyway, this morning, what, what, what this passage reveals to us is that something incredible, something powerful, something miraculous happened 
to Paul. Now don't miss this. If you've been a Christian a long time, I think it's easy to miss how powerful, uh, how potent the life change uh, that happened in Paul is. It's easy to miss this, but don't miss it. God powerfully, divinely changed and transformed Paul. He was the biggest human enemy of the early Christian church. All right, you can read about this in the book of Acts. Acts chapter nine tells Paul's story of his conversion. He shares his testimony and talks about his story like five or six times in the book of Acts. Uh, he shares a little bit here in the book of Galatians. Uh, and what he tells us in all these stories is that he was in excellent standing in his career, right? He was a really great Jewish uh, like student, right? He was actually a, a Pharisee, so he was a Jewish teacher. He was, he was teaching, he was growing quickly, uh, he was advancing beyond his peers, this passage tells us. Uh, he was high up and deeply devoted to Judaism. He was fully invested. This was his life, this was his plan, every bit. Uh, of what he had spent his time doing was to accomplish uh, the, his, his goals as a leader in Judaism. He had much to gain from destroying the Christian church. He had much to gain from it, so he did. Right? He hated Christians, and he had much to gain from destroying Christians, and he had much to lose from joining Christians. His Jewish faith, his career, his reputation, uh, and possibly even his life. In fact, the Bible tells us that as soon as he converts, uh, all the Jewish leaders start to try to figure out how they can kill Paul. Right, they're trying to kill this guy. Uh, and, uh, but he had so much to lose. And in fact, he writes uh, this beautiful uh, passage of scripture in Philippians where he says, uh, I count everything as loss. Everything before that I used to count as gain. He says, I count it all as loss in exchange for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. All right, so he's saying he had lots of gain in his life before Jesus. He had you know, a great career, and he was making good money, and he was well-regarded, and he laid all that down to take Jesus. This may happen to you. You may have a lot in your life, and Jesus says, I want you to lay it down and give it to me. All right? But Paul said, there's not a single thing. He said all that he counted as gain. Now he's like, no, no, no. There's nothing more valuable than the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. He's like, I'd trade anything. He'd trade the greatest treasures, the greatest career, the greatest of all things, just to have the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, right? Like, th this, is, this is the weight of Scripture. He tells us this. So he had much to gain from destroying Christians, much to lose from becoming a Christian. To him, Jesus uh, isn't just inconvenient. Jesus is blasphemy. This is actually why the Jewish people wanted Jesus dead, because he came, and, and they, there's this passage in the book of John, and if you don't know your Bible well, I'll give you some background here, but uh, here's, I encourage you to read it a lot. It's, it's like full of like, you, when, you read the, when you really read the Bible, you're like, there's no wisdom like this, right? You can listen to the greatest like, biochemists of our day, the greatest you know, chemists and philosophers of our day. You can tell my science background. I'm like, the biochemists and the chemists, they're so smart. Uh, but the, you, know, you can talk to the, the famous philosophers of our day or the you know, gurus of our day, and they are nothing compared to the wisdom on, in the word of God. I mean, it surpasses, you know, the Bible says God's ways are higher and greater. So there's this story. Jesus wasn't just inconvenient for Paul, he was blasphemy to Paul. So there's this story where uh, there's this character, Abraham, who's sort of the first father of Judaism. It's, it's through Abraham that God creates the covenant that becomes, like he creates the promise that becomes the Jewish religion. Abraham's like the first one, and, uh, and that, that kind of formalizes them as, as a people. Uh, and, and so uh, it's funny because they say, well, are you greater? The, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, are you greater than our father Abraham? And Jesus says, before Abraham, I am, which is the name God uses for himself. And they're literally like tear their clothes. Like imagine being upset so much that you go Hulk Hogan, like 1989 Hulk Hogan, and you rip out, you know, and for most of us, the belly comes out, right? Rawr, you know, uh, and, 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 like, and they're like, and they go to kill him. They immediately want to kill him. Because him, a mere man, in their eyes, made himself equal with God. So Jesus isn't just inconvenient, he is committing blasphemy. He's saying, I'm God in human form. To the, like, this is, by the way, the least likely development to happen in Judaism. 
Like if, if you're like, oh, how can Christianity be real? I want you to consider that God took one of the least likely scenarios and, 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 and created the world's most powerful history altering religion from it, right? The Jewish people who are like, they had the highest view of God of any of the ancient peoples, right? In the ancient world, gods were gods of regions. Like you'd have the God of St. Joe, Missouri, who would keep Lake Contrary polluted or something like that. You had like regional, you had like regional territorial gods. And when they got out the region, they had no power, right? And the Jews were like, no, no, no. God, Yahweh, the God of gods, he is high, in, he is in heaven, he rules and reigns, not just over Israel, he's not the God of Israel and just the God, he is the God of the universe, right? He rules over all things, and the Old Testament is full of stories. Like, if you don't know this, it's crazy, because in the Old Testament, the Israel people, wherever they go, God goes with them, right? Doesn't matter where their regions are, doesn't matter where the borders are, they could be in Egypt, God moves and sets them free. It does not matter, he overcomes, he is above and greater and higher, right? He's so far off and set apart, he is beyond their comprehension, like their, their views of holiness. If they came into the temple the wrong way, they would die, not because God would smite them, but because his holiness is so potent, so strong, so other, they couldn't stand to be in his presence, and they would die. And that view of God does not lend itself well to God coming and becoming a man and then laying down and washing people's feet. But I want you to know, this is how God has revealed himself. Right, there's power in this, in Christianity. To him, God is, or Christ is blasphemy. God in human form, God who died, God who served. These were not things devout Jews could even believe about God. All right? This is why, this is why Paul was so violently persecuting the church. They were blaspheming God. Christianity would have been an abomination to Paul, something worth completely destroying. So he would help arrest Christians. He tried to, he says in his own words, violently destroy the church. He's willing to see Christians put to death because of their faith. Again, he is essentially the least likely person to convert to Christianity. He's the least likely person to become a believer in Jesus. And yet here he is <laughs> writing the book of Galatians to us. Uh, 2,000 years later, we are sitting here with this letter. I don't understand how people are like, is there any evidence really for God's existence? <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, what? Like, I just, here we are, the least likely person who hated the church. Here's the church being built up by his writings about how glorious and wonderful Jesus is. Like, nobody writes like Je about Jesus the way Paul does. It's so unique and wonderful and beautiful. He was the least likely person to love Jesus, and yet God completely changed him. He was completely redeemed, completely transformed by God. It was a miraculous work of God. It was not men convincing him. It was God transforming him completely through spiritual power. He makes this so clear. He's like, the gospel I have, it's not man's gospel. I received it from a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's very clear. God transforms him through God's spiritual power. Let me ask you this, who's the least likely person you know to become a Christian? Do you believe God can change them? Are you praying for that person? Do you have an expectation of like, God can do this? All right, I have a friend that you know, I've been praying for a long, long time, had no contact with, and, and, and God's stirring their heart. And God's stirring his heart, and I'm just like, man, this is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Who's the least likely person you know to become a Christian? Are you praying for that person? Are you being like Christ to them, even if it costs you something? <clears throat> what I love about Paul's story here is that it's, it's like at the beginning of the church, God wanted to show us his power at work by converting the greatest early rival of the Christian church. God wants you to know his power is sufficient, right? Jesus is enough. His, God's power is more than sufficient for all that you need in this life. It's for all that you need in this life. And the greatest miraculous work of God is how he changes hearts from being opposed to Jesus, from walking in darkness, to, to loving Christ and walking in the light. This is the greatest miracle God pulls off in our day, changing human hearts. And God wanted to show us early his power by converting the greatest early rival of the Christian church. So Paul is laboring in this letter. You re, as we read it, he's laboring in this letter to make it clear. Like, he, the work is God's. Uh, you know, and the idea here isn't that God doesn't use people. In fact, it's his great pleasure to use people. God loves to use us. The big idea here is that there is real power, 
available in God. There is right now for you in your heart, there is real power available in Jesus, real transformation from God, through God, and to God. And today, you can experience that real power. You can experience actual transformation in your life. You can see as you walk in obedience with God, faithful obedience with God, which every time you walk in faithful obedience to God, it will go beyond your understanding. You'll be like, I don't see how this is gonna work. But eventually you grow mature in faith and you're like, I don't see how this is gonna work, but I've seen him do it before. He'll do it again. Right? And then you become basically like a wild man or a wild woman of faith. You know, like you just got, and you're just like, I don't know how, I don't see it, but I'm praying for it, and I believe he's going to do it. And guess what? He will start to do that kind of stuff uh, around you and in you, right? You can experience this kind of life, right? You can be transformed, and God wants to use you as a conduit for his real spiritual power, Right? Again, in this letter, what's Paul say? He was, God was pleased to reveal the Son. God is pleased to reveal himself to you. He's pleased to draw near to you. He loves, uh, through Christ, to come be among his people. And he loves to use us for his purposes. Right? He, he gave Paul not just himself, but also a call. Right? This is the same thing. We, we, have not just, we don't just receive God. We receive purpose. We receive a call with God. Most of the time in the Bible... God does his work using people who serve like Christ, who love like Christ, who preach Christ as he works through them, all right? And, and, and it's the same, but here's the thing. You get confidence in this when you recognize it isn't your effort, it's his power working through faithful believers who go in the name of Jesus, all right? So how do we live this life? How do we experience this power? How do we find this transformation? Well, there's two things. We, 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 we got to encounter Jesus. Uh, and there's an initial encounter we have with Jesus. Many of you have had that. And then there's an ongoing encounter with Jesus that we need to have. Now, your initial encounter with Jesus may not be as dramatic as Paul's. Uh, he was on his way to arrest a bunch of Christians. Jesus appears to him. Uh, he's so glorious that Paul is blinded uh, by the encounter. And he has to be healed of his sight uh, in order to see again. Uh, you can see that in the Acts chapter 9. Uh, so uh, even though our, our initial experience may not be as dramatic as Paul's, we can experience Jesus in the same exact power of transformation that Paul encounters in him. Right? So you have an initial counter, encounter with Jesus where it's just like, I didn't see, I once was blind, now I see. Right? It's a very clear change of who you are. But it's not just a once and done encounter it's something we on go. So where is it that we encounter Jesus? How do we experience him? Well, we encounter Jesus daily uh, in the word, and we encounter Jesus uh, daily as we obey his word, right? So we encounter Jesus daily in his word, and we encounter Jesus daily as we obey his word, right? And let me ask you this. Is your life, if you're here and you're like, yes, I am a Christian, I have to, I'm going to ask you this question. Is your life with Jesus a daily and hourly experience? Is your life with Christ a daily and hourly experience? Is the Lord of your life Jesus, right? Is he Lord of your life, directing each moment by his truth, or is he a small add-on, someone you go to only in certain moments of your life? <clears throat> is your life in your hands, or is it in his hands, right? To encounter Jesus daily is to find him, to hear him, to receive him daily. And the Bible is where he reveals himself, you find Jesus in the word of God. As you read, God will be revealed to you. The secrets of your heart will be revealed to you. I'm gonna read a passage to you here. This is John 3, 16 through 21. I read it a couple of weeks ago, but I've added some passages to it that we didn't read last time. We're gonna read it again. It says, for God so loved the world. Again, it starts with God, his love, that he gave his only son. Again, God, he loved the world and he gave, right? He's the one initiating this work. Uh, he is the son, right? He gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. The Bible says we all need saving and he's the savior. The Bible says that if you are not in Christ, you stand condemned. If you don't believe in Jesus, you stand condemned. And you might be like, well, I don't like that. Well, sometimes truth, here's the, here's the, here's the crazy thing about truth. It's true whether you like it or not. 
Uh, And if it's condemnation or salvation, I think I'd like to know what the way forward is. And and it, it can be a hard pill to swallow, and we certainly, we are called to be a people of grace and mercy. But the truth here is, is weighty. Like Jesus is saying, I've come as a savior. He's revealed himself. Again, time is split around him. He's trying to make it as obvious as possible. You know how many Bibles there are in English? There's so many. Like, so I, I just capture this moment with me here. So think about this. Here I am saying it's about condemnation or salvation, eternal death or eternal life, right? And, and, and we're like, well, we don't like that. And yet, like, listen, hold up. Listen to this. Like, the Bible is available to everyone, and yet we don't look in here. We're like, the problem's on God's end, not on ours. Like, how dare he say it's condemnation? And yet, it's like, honestly, do, do most people you know care? Do most people you know who can read seek the word? And here's the crazy thing. Even if you don't like to read or you're not good at reading, you can hear the word. Not just, the, the, like, you can hear the Bible. Like, you can get an audio Bible. You can get, like, we live in a day and an age where the Bible is more accessible than any other time. I just think people don't care. And you're like, well, why is this? Well, let's keep reading. Let me tell you why, because John gives us the answer. He tells us here. All right, again, let me read it again. Verse 18, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, right? We find salvation in Christ. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's a controversial Christian truth, but it's true. And this is the judgment. Ready? What's the Bible say about about our world's hatred of this? This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The light has come into the world to reveal truth to all people. Jesus is the sa- You need saving, and here's a savior. God could have said, you need saving, but I'm not helping. God would have been perfectly right to condemn all of humanity. The Bible tells us this. It is true. We all stand guilty. The fact that he's even willing to save one person is a miraculous work of the grace and mercy of God. The problem is not, the problem is not that we somehow are the light and God is the darkness. That's how it gets reframed in humanistic terms, right? Like, well, how could God allow such suffering? Did you, think about this. If, if, if every human being right now on the planet Earth were to become perfectly righteous right in this moment, how much of the suffering of the world would end right now? Think about that. If every single human stopped lying, stopped stealing, stopped hurting, stopped abusing, stopped taking, stopped hiding, stopped sinning, in every way stopped murdering, stopped raping, stopped rebelling, right? And sin isn't just not doing evil. Sin is, like, sin is, is refusing to do what's good. So imagine we stop doing all the evil we're doing, and we begin to do all the good. We've got all this money. Let's feed all the hungry. Hey, we got all this money. Let's give everybody, let's take care of everybody. Hey, we got all this money. Let's, let's use it for the best possible thing we could. If we were all perfectly righteous, how much suffering in the world would disappear overnight? I think like 99% would, right? Like 1% of human suffering is caused by like nature. The other 99% is caused by us who sit back and judge God. How could he allow so much suffering? How could we? What are we doing? Right? And, I, and I just, here's the point. Here's what I'm trying to get at. I, like, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to point to the Bible that says, before Christ we were condemned, and we refuse to see the light. We refuse to believe. We like the darkness because it makes us feel better. You know, people say ignorance is bliss. We're ignorant about our condition. We're ignorant about how bad sin is. Tim Keller says, the message of the gospel is this. You're worse than you could have ever thought or imagined. Your sin is worse than you ever could have thought or imagined. But the love and grace of God is far greater than you could have ever asked for or thought of. Right? It's like we are worse than we ever thought, but God's glory and goodness is greater than we could have asked or imagined. The Bible tells us that. What he has for us is better than we could think. It's better than we could imagine. It's important that you see the truth of the word. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Jesus has come to illuminate the world. We have access to it. We don't look for it. It's like a flashlight to reality. A light for my feet and a lamp for my path, Psalm 119 says. This is like a flashlight for your life. It's like it shines and you see, and the first thing it does is it puts you in front of a mirror and it shines a light and you go, uh-oh. <laughs> That's what happens. I didn't realize. I need a savior. I need transformation. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. Lord, 
Help me. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. If you don't see how true this is, I cannot help you. You refuse to see the light. If, 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 if every person on the planet suddenly became perfectly righteous overnight, 99% of human suffering would end. Guys, right, if we really are as good as we say we are, as we really are in such a high place to judge God, why don't we do that? The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. We are not perfectly righteous, not even close. The Bible tells us this. Romans 3 says all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all hide, we all lie, we all have deceived. And yet, in Christ, we can be forgiven, we can have eternal life. Right? Isn't it crazy? Right? You've heard John 3.16 a lot. People like don't go deep enough often into the word of God. <laughs> right? And John 3, 6, 3, 16 is glorious, it's wonderful. It is like, the, by the way, the light shines in the darkness and the light overcomes the darkness. Right? There is no darkness too deep that God's, God's light cannot reach it. There is no hope that is too hopeless for Jesus to redeem. It says, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may clearly be seen that his works have been carried out in God. Finding Jesus is like finding light. The Bible says we have sin in us and many of us have secrets in our lives and in our hearts. We can feel opposed to the light, afraid of the light, but Jesus came to cleanse us, to forgive us. He takes our sins on the cross. He takes our death. He doesn't just take our sin and death. He takes the sin and death committed against us. And when he died, he died for us. He died in our place. He died as a sacrifice to redeem us even from the sin committed against us. And then he burst from the grave. He rose to victorious life, leaving sin and death and hell in the grave. And anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but finds eternal life, finds the light. In Christ, you don't have to hide anymore. He didn't come to condemn, he came to save. He doesn't come to poke and prod, but when he shines his light upon you, for a moment, right, (laughs) you will see some dark things in your heart. Right now even, like you know it, you know the dark secrets, you know the sins that you haven't, you know, that they're not. Jesus again, he's not like, I just wanna tell you how bad you are, no, no, no. He wants to redeem, he wants to forgive. But you don't look for a savior if you don't think you need saving. You don't look for forgiveness if you don't think you need it. Today, Jesus is calling you to step fully into his light. Do you have secrets in your heart, hidden sin? Confess it today. We're gonna have a prayer time here at the end. You'll have an opportunity to pray, to confess, to repent, and to turn, to give it to Jesus, and you will find spiritual power and transformation. Now, encountering Jesus isn't just a one-time thing. It's not just a, well, I gave my life to Jesus. It's, no, no, it's a trans, an ongoing transformation. It's the treasure of our life, the source of our life. The Bible describes Jesus as a rock and as a spring of living water. Jesus is a rock that makes you immovable, and he's a spring of living water. There's no end to the depth of joy you can experience in God. There's no end to the depth of peace you can experience with God. That you can, the Bible says you can taste and see that the Lord is good. That every day there's a new treasure in God to discover. There's new life in God for you to discover. There's new transformation in Christ for you to experience. There's new stretching of faith for you to walk in. There's new obedience for you to go in that you would see God's power demonstrate. There's new people for you to love and care for. And there's nothing like this life that Jesus has for us. He is both an unshakable foundation that holds you through anything and everything this world can throw your way. Don't miss this. Jesus is an unshakable foundation that holds you through anything and everything that this world can throw your way. He's an enjoyable spring of living water that never runs dry and never fails to satisfy. In Christ, we can search the depths of what is life, what is joy, what is peace, what is pleasure, what is goodness, what is love. And as we daily walk with Jesus and we daily walk in the light, it will reveal things in our heart that can't coexist with light. But God will heal them and bless them. I'm gonna have to wrap this thing up. 
but I hope God is stirring your heart. It's a life experiencing Christ. It's a life walking with Christ. This is the heart of Christianity. A full surrender to Jesus, giving our lives completely to him and receiving back eternal life, receiving back joy, purpose, peace, love, and goodness. When you see it, when you really let the light shine and you see it and you believe it, when you walk in it, it will completely transform you forever. There's this passage in 2 Corinthians. It says that we all, with unveiled faces, behold the glory of the Lord. So, so it's like there's this veil that can rest over our eyes that keeps us from seeing, right? It keeps us in darkness. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit, faith in Christ, reveals this, uh, that, that removes this. And, that when we, and then it says, and we behold the glory of the Lord. And it says, and we, beholding the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces, are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next into the image of Christ. So it's saying as we look at Jesus, as we seek him, The more you seek him, the more you look at him, the more you're transformed to be like him. And when we see him with unveiled face, when we really see him, it completely changes us forever from one degree of glory to the next. This is what happened to Paul. He had a dramatic encounter with Jesus and he continued with a deep life in Jesus. This is what God wants to do in you today, right? What is God stirring your heart for? What, what, is the, what is the step of faith for you this morning? What is deeper life with Jesus? Maybe you're here. I mean, I, here's the thing. There are gonna be people all over the place this morning in different places. Maybe you're here and you're coming in and you're like, man, I, my heart is on fire. I'm ablaze for what Jesus has for me. I loved every minute of this sermon. I wanna run my life through and live in the light. And I would just say, man, keep going. Woman, sister, brother, sister, keep going. Keep running, all right? Stretch, you know, what, is, what does it mean to stretch your faith? What does it mean to stretch your obedience? What does it mean to stretch yourself deeper into the word, deeper into your prayer life, deeper into the life Jesus has for you? Maybe you're here and you're like, I feel stagnant. I feel like I used to run. and Today I'm feeling rough and I'm feeling hard and I'm feeling condemned actually. Mike, I know you said you're not trying to condemn, but I'm feeling condemned. Well, we would call that conviction. We are, we are people, when we, sometimes we can feel it, but Christians, we are not convicted without hope. Right? Conviction always has hope. Hope for redemption, hope for better things, hope for God's life and God's purpose in you, hope for God's transformation in you. So maybe you're here and you're a believer, but you've been stagnant and you just need some, you need some Holy Spirit in you today. You need God to set you free today. I would encourage you, come forward, we'll pray for you. Maybe you're here and you're like, I have done, no, I don't know if I'm even a Christian. Maybe that's where you're at. You're like, what you're talking about and my understanding of what it means to be a Christian, I don't think that's me. I don't think I believe that. I don't know if I, I I've never heard this. I heard John 6, 3, 3, 16, but I live my life not in the light. I haven't picked up my Bible and read it in years. I didn't know. I don't know. Here's, here I got good, gloriously good news for you. Jesus sees you and he loves you and he wants to draw you in. And so if that's where you're at this morning, you're like, I don't even know if I'm a believer. I would just invite you forward to pray. I'll be over here. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to like reveal let Jesus to you uh, because he's good. He has light. He has glory for you. He has transformation for you. And you can experience it this morning. All right. If you need prayer for anything else, I'm going to call the band up. The band's going to come. Sometimes the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you up here. It went a little different than I was intending, but I believe God's moving here this morning. Don't, don't miss it. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. Don't hold back, but come forward, step forward. If you want all that Jesus has for you this morning, he wants to bless you. Like he, again, he's a fountain of living water. The primary heart this morning is not, how dare you? The primary heart this morning should be, why would you trade anything else for the glory of Jesus? He has such good things for you. He has life for you. We live in a world full of people in darkness, full of people who are dying, who are miserable, who are hating and being hated. And Jesus wants to come and redeem and transform, to give us his righteousness, to give us his life, his joy, his peace, put us on a firm foundation and to satisfy us with his living water. To settle for anything else is to settle for something infinitely less and what God has for you. So I'm gonna pray, and I just encourage you as we worship, if you're in any of those camps, if you're in any of those categories, come forward. We'd love to pray with you this morning. You can write on your communication card, like, hey, pray for me about this. But I just encourage you, come forward. Don't miss that chance. Heavenly Father, I do ask that this morning you would just come and bless us. 
Lord, that your light would just shine uh, upon our hearts. I pray that you would just pour out real spiritual power right here and now that stirs hearts. God, where there's conviction, I pray you would stir repentance, but then you would stir an even greater outpouring of mercy and grace and love. You came to save, not to condemn. But Lord, if we're hiding in the dark, if we're not stepping out into the light because we're afraid, we miss out. We miss out on the life that you have for us. We miss out on the transformation that you have for us. And Father, I pray just like Paul was radically transformed, radically encountered your power, and was given a radical call, that this morning you would radically transform us, that you would give us a powerful call. Lord, not by our effort, but by your power. By, it's literally just by beholding the glory of the Lord. It's by stepping into the light, letting the, like bathing in the light as we walk with you. Lord, I pray, do a work in our hearts today. This is, I feel like every time I preach, it's beyond me, Lord. It's, it's in your hands. It takes your power. It takes your move. It takes your spirit. And I just pray, Father, move in power. Come, Holy Spirit. Wash and change and transform. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Jesus, carry our burdens. Draw us into your light and transform us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.